I think there is some misunderstandings around the gift of tongues. It's really easy to think that somehow the Holy Spirit just comes over and starts wagging your tongue about. Our ability to cast out demons is simply because we're in Christ. That's the only gift that's pluralized. It calls it gifts of healings. It's highly likely everybody is called to do some healing prayer. Hi everyone, thanks again for tuning in to The Two Things You Shouldn't Talk About. I'm delighted today to be joined by uh, Michael Miller. Michael, thank you so much for, for joining me today on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to, to join us today. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. I'm glad it worked out. I, uh, I know that I was supposed to do it last week and totally had to bail on you, so I'm so sorry about that. So I'm glad we got to it this week. Yeah, I, like I said, I want to talk to you today just about the topic of spiritual gifts because... Um, I'm a fan of the Remnant Radio. You know, I love what you guys do and kind of making that a little more approachable, especially seeing as um, it's probably not something that, or it's not a church scene that I really grew up in entirely. We were kind of, I guess what you guys say, like cautious, but open, a charismatic, we're not charismatic, but continuationists. So we were open to these things existing and, and being real and taking place, but probably not something that was necessarily pursued at all times or I, necessarily I think, uh, talked about all that much. I think what I call that is a uh, cessationist in practice that just refused to acknowledge it. <laughs> right. Well, I, I mean, I remember when someone first started talking about um, the gift of prophecy and everyone was like, oh, there's, there's someone who thinks they're a bit of a prophet in our church, I guess, you know, and they, or something like that. You know, it's like people were talking like there's, it was something new, something, you know, that hasn't been around since the dawn of time, effectively. So it's, uh, yeah, we were, we were always, it was a little new to us. But um, I think as I've matured, I've kind of got a little more curious about that, because I don't see a good biblical reason why it doesn't exist today. So um, I guess that's where I stand. I haven't seen any reason why it shouldn't exist. So why not? You know, you kind of have to pursue what what seems to be uh you know obvious from scripture that these things are real that and that we can we can uh, make use of them today so uh just before we get started do you want to give our listeners a little bit of an introduction as to who you are if they haven't seen you before sure kind of what you're all about maybe a little of your background yeah so i uh, grew up in a very i would say mixed background jewish mother mormon father uh, we went to the Mormon church till I was about seven years old. Um, so I never got baptized, thank goodness, into the Mormon church, that is. Uh, you know, I'd go to an occasional Yom Kippur service with my grandparents or go see stuff that my grandfather was doing uh, when he would compose music for the, the temple that he went to in, in Dallas. Um, but was, I mean, I would say a self-proclaimed atheist by the age of 15 until um, somebody gave me a Bible and I read it. And so that was kind of the beginning of my Christian walk. I uh, got discipled up in Young Life. Uh, I was on staff for a couple of years and then uh, got my hands on a book called Surprised by the Power of the Holy Spirit by Jack Deere. And I had already begun to believe in the gifts, uh, not believe in the gifts, believe that the gifts were still happening. Believed in the third person of the Trinity, I should say. Uh, and had, but I just didn't have any... Um, Nobody in my Bible cessationist Bible churches or Young Life circles were, were doing these things. And so Jack's book really helped me make sense of what I was already beginning to see happen. And so I ended up getting discipled by Jack as well. And then um, uh, went to go plant several churches. I uh, got fired from my church in 2019. Uh, it was probably a more, it was in a re really abusive, charismatic environment. So I've kind of seen the spectrum and the gamut here when it comes to charismaticism, the good, the bad, the ugly. And then have uh, since then uh, been pastoring a church in Denver, Colorado, which I helped plant uh, right at the beginning of 20, 2020, uh, COVID. And uh, yet we are thriving today and very thankful to be doing what I'm doing as well as, uh, yeah, I have a podcast uh, with the, the other, with the Remnant Radio um, and then do a ton of traveling and speaking on the gifts of the Spirit, uh, healing, deliverance, all of those things that would be considered you know, quote unquote, charismatic. Yeah. And the way I discovered your show, um, you know, I'm surprised I hadn't discovered it earlier because it was, you know, it's a pretty big, uh, show in terms of the Christian scene, I think on YouTube, but, um, we did an episode with a friend of mine Um we did a couple, but he was kind of talking about, um, a, a channel that he made called testing the prophets where he kind of took some of these big words and, you know, tested them to see if they come true. It was kind of the time around the yeah. The 2020 election when, you know, you had the 
um, like the Dana Coverstone and that kind of stuff. A lot of stuff coming out every week. Um, Dude, that, so. that, that, was, that was a scary prophecy. Yeah, well, I was. I remember him saying about the was it the White House being empty and wolves gathering around, and I was I, I was just hoping that it wouldn't come to pass the way he said. But he was right about a couple things at least on the way there. So, um, luckily, it didn't seem. I mean, it could it could I guess have some some imagery there that could still be seen as, as true or it could be interpreted as true, but. Um, Luckily, I guess the fall of the nation didn't quite happen yet, unless it's in a spiritual sense. But yeah, yeah, we'll we'll see this year. But it's uh, you know the, the, all that to say that um, when I posted some of these clips on um, on Instagram, someone commented and tagged your your Instagram page and said, "This is something you guys are doing," or they they kind of said, "Oh, this is similar to, to Remnant Radio because you did the same thing." So that led me to kind of check out your channel and. And saw a lot of the yeah the content on the spiritual gifts. So, uh, just to get started on that, that, let's sort of go over some, I guess, some ground rules or definitions about what 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 we believe and what we don't believe. Because um, sure, a lot of people will think, I guess, straight away of like Toronto blessing kind of stuff. And I'm sure there's you know there's pros and cons to to all of that. But they might think, you know, well, does this mean you know, quacking like a duck and walking on all fours, is that the proper exercise of the spiritual gifts? Or is it saying, you know, speaking in King James English on YouTube and saying, thus saith the Lord, Trump is serving a second term in a spiritual, you know, what, what are the, what's the proper use of spiritual gifts at the minute? What do you think that looks like? And, you know, if you were to think of some rules as to how you would um, discern between healthy exercise of the gifts and unhealthy, you know, what would, what would you be thinking of? So it just depends. Uh, okay, so w- what do you want to dive into? Do you want to talk prophecy? Do you want to talk tongues? Do you want to talk? Because uh, if you if you want the the question is broad enough to where I could go in a lot of different directions there. Yeah. Um. um let's start off, I guess, with uh, let's start off with tongues because I think it's the first one that a lot of people will think of, especially when they're sure. not familiar with the with the gifts. Okay. Uh, so there's a number of varying opinions on this. Um, I, you know, I, I would not fall into what's called second blessing theology or, um, initial physical evidence. I don't fall into that category. So the Pentecostal, uh, circles, they would say that the, um, evidence of the baptism of the spirit is speaking in tongues and, uh, but then how they define what tongues is would might vary some, but they would just say language in a general sense. Although the early Pentecostals, they thought it was a, an earthly known tongue. And for that reasons, they, they, at least those who came out of Azusa, they were literally going out into the world because they thought whatever language they had, that's the nation they were supposed to be sent to. So there's a lot of disillusioned missionaries that went out into the field. But, you know, interestingly enough, it ended up being quite impactful. It's the reason why the Pentecostal movement is the fastest growing movement on the nation. Um, or I mean, in the world, not just the nation. Um, but that was their d- doctrine, that the evidence of the baptism of the Spirit was speaking in tongues. Um, and, you know, since then, when it came to whether it was a, a known language or some sort of angelic language or maybe some language that's existed at some point in time in history but may now be dead, um, varying opinions on that, although I would say they've probably changed their tune and, and did change their belief on it after all these missionaries were like, <laughs> they mm-hmm. couldn't find the nation where they <laughs> yeah. spoke that language. Yeah. Um, so that's the Pentecostal position, historic Pentecostal position. Um, and then within that position, there's also those who would say, you don't even have uh, the spirit. You're not even a Christian if you don't have the spirit and don't speak in tongues. Although here's the interesting thing today is most of my friends that are AG, most uh, Assembly of God, which is a you know classical Pente- Pentecostal, Pentecostal tradition, uh, they'll say tongues as an evidence, but not the evidence. So even amongst that tribe, they're changing their tune on that. They don't, they don't, it's still technically one of their fundamentals, but I've seldom found a uh, Pentecostal that still holds to that fundamental. And so I wouldn't be surprised if those, those fundamentals change in the next uh, 20 years or so. But um, then there's another side of this, which would be, uh, the amongst charismatics, we would also disagree about this, but um, there's like the four square denomination that say the gift of tongues is uh, for everyone. One of the the popular 
theologians out of the four square denomination wrote a book called heavenly languages or what he says is that tongues is just simply a language to pray in and that there's a difference between what's called a prayer language and a gift of tongues He'd say that a gift of tongues is meant to be done publicly with uh, the gift of interpretation. But then there's this other gift that's called a prayer language uh, that's just meant for you and the Lord. And so I find that doctrine disagreeable as well because it often is used to justify people speaking in tongues in a church service or in a gathering in front of others that may be unbelievers or, or even believers uninformed about the gifts. Um, to do it without interpretation, right? Um, and so, so interpretation then, uh, is definitely something that is really desirable whenever it's being operated in public. Yeah, well, at least for me, it is. Um, mm. And then I would say there's a, a third position, which is where Sam Storms would fall into, mm-hmm. and he would say that uh, tongues is a prayer language. You could have that. Um, it could be a natural language, but it's probably angelic. Mm-hmm. Um, and it says, you know, for no one understands him and his spirit, he speaks mysteries. Right. Um, and then there's my position, which is, I think, uh, a vast minority, uh, mm-hmm. position, which is that tongues is just simply a language that God gives, whether mm-hmm. it's earthly and natural, uh, or, uh, an ancient language or yeah. a heavenly language. Um, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think it could be any of those as a possibility, um, but I do think that there is no difference between a prayer language and a gift of tongues. I think it's just simply called tongues. There's no, otherwise, there's no way to uh, differentiate between that when it's talking about it in Corinthians. Mm-hmm. You have to sort of arbitrarily say, well, this is a prayer language, and this over here is a gift of tongues. Right. I would just say that tongues is the gift, and you, with that gift, can do a lot of different things. You mm-hmm. can pray in that language. You can sing in that language. And when there's interpretation, you could prophesy, you could teach, you could give revelation, give words of knowledge with interpretation. All of those things are possible with the same language. Mm -hmm. Right, because tongues is effectively just another word for a language. It's not, you know, it's really like saying gift of language. So that does, that leaves it open to what kind of a language it is. You know, it doesn't necessarily specify earthly, heavenly, spiritual, whatever. Um, So I always find it kind of troubling, I think, whenever I heard because we don't have AG in the UK where I'm from, at least that we have some Pentecostal groups, but they're, I, I had never heard of Assemblies of God. And when I heard yeah. people say that, you know, they were they were worried or that some people would be worried that I didn't speak in tongues and worried for my salvation because it shows that I don't have the Holy Spirit. That kind of troubled yeah. me because I was like, okay, well, does everyone in that church prophesy as well? Because that's, that seems to be the more important one scripturally, you know, it says. Yeah, well, that's that's a vast minority of people today. Yeah. You won't find many people saying you're not a Christian even. Mm. You're not even saved. That's yeah. very, very rare. It's traditional, I guess, Although a lot I, of older people. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, 20 years ago, probably more popular. Mm-hmm. Today, that, not so the, much. The, yeah, not so much. That's fallen out of favor. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what, the, there's a, those are like four basic positions. Mm-hmm. With mine being the the minority again, yeah. uh, Sam Storms is probably the more popular mm-hmm. position, and and Sam and I talked about it, and um, yeah, you know, Sam's got some really great arguments. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think I would uh, tend to naturally agree with kind of the way you articulated it, where I wouldn't be um, like it's hard it's hard to be sure that they're distinct or that there's that you can make differentiations because you don't really know, I guess, when you receive that gift, which or what way it will be used yeah. by God, because you don't, you know, I'm speaking as someone who doesn't speak, <laughs> who hasn't spoken in tongues, but I assume it's not, you don't really get a choice as to which one you're going to, to speak at a particular time. So it's kind of... Well, you get a choice as to when you speak, you mm-hmm. just don't get a choice as to what language it is. Right. So uh, Other than your native language, you can choose that. Right. <laughs> um, well, and I think there is some misunderstandings around the gift of tongues, mm-hmm. especially from those who've never done it. It's really easy to think that it's ecstatic speech, mm-hmm. that it somehow the Holy Spirit just comes over and starts wagging your tongue about. Right. It's um, like a fervor. And, and just yeah, I, biblically, I think that's untenable, although I, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens you know, on occasion where God does yeah. take over and do something, especially initially. Yeah, I know a number of people, when they first started speaking in tongues, that's kind of what happened. Mm-hmm. But uh, after that, it's entirely voluntary. They can choose when to speak, when not to. Mm-hmm. But yet, the words coming out of their mouth are not their choice. Just simply the, right. the the act of doing it is their choice. 
Yeah. Uh, and so you kind of don't really know where where God steps in on the process, like where you begin and where mm-hmm. He begins. It's it's not so clear, uh, both anecdotally and then also scripturally speaking. Mm-hmm. But one thing is clear, that a person who speaks in tongues can refrain from doing it. It is mm-hmm. a choice. Otherwise, he wouldn't. Paul would never tell the Corinthian church to stop doing it without an interpreter. Right. Like he's telling them, don't do this unless there's interpretation. Otherwise, just do it quietly to yourself. Mm-hmm. And so the the choice is clearly theirs to do so. Um, yeah. So that misconception is, a, I think, a big one. Um, a lot of people, when they really want that gift, they sort of they're sort of expecting God to take over their tongue. Mm, I'm like, it just yeah. doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's actually, I guess, speaking. What what um, or one of the premises of this conversation that I was kind of thinking of as someone who has, I guess, <laughs> for want of a better term, dabbled in spiritual gifts, and I feel like I've. When you say dabbled, it makes it's, it sound like witchcraft. Well, yeah. Sorry to any more it's sensitive dabbled viewers. Dabbled in the dark arts. Yeah, just yeah. a little touch here and there. You know, I was actually listening to the to your episode about the, um, what was it the um, the magic, um, the evangelism, the evangelism of oh yeah, magic with uh, stuff, Elijah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so that was, that, those are good know, episodes. That's timely, you know, thinking about witchcraft and that kind of stuff. But um, you know, I would say that I, you coming from a, that more skeptical background. Um, I'd only really heard horror stories. So, you know, when I first heard the holy giggles for the first time, that was an unsettling experience, you know, and yeah. I was like, self-control, fruit of the spirit. I was like, I don't know how I feel about all this. And then sure. I kind of shelved it. And then my wife came along, who is a, a real babbler, I guess you could say, you know, loves to speak in tongues wherever, you know, all the time. Mm-hmm. If, she, if she, you know, it's just her, it's her personal way to express an intimacy with God. And that's something that I hadn't, you know, grown up with. So then I, I kind of fall into the, I guess the John Piper category where it's like, I I pray every now and then, you know, Lord, would you give me this? Or can I, would you show me more prophetic stuff? Cause I've had some things here and there, but would you give me some more? I would love to have a bit of this, you know, can, would you, would you give me that gift? So I have never had like an impartation or anything. And I know you've talked about that as well in the past, but you know, maybe today's the day, but uh, that's kind of, um, that's kind of where I, I stand. So what I, what I'm curious about is, from a, a beginner's perspective, thinking of gifts like tongues, I wouldn't know how to even do it. Do you just kind of wait for something to overtake you, like you're saying, just go, buh, 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 buh. Yeah, I think that's something? Yeah. Or do you have to try and like try and speak, or does it happen? That's what I'm, I was always curious about that. So what I, would you say? I can tell you, if, yeah, if, uh, here's the thing we don't have biblical precedent uh, for it being one way or the other. We just know that they did it. I mean, it does seem like it sort of happened to them rather than them participating in it uh, early on. But yet you have a very explicit statement of Paul saying, don't do it, which means you have a choice. Don't do it without interpretation. Um, In a public setting, obviously, he's he's talking about the, the formal gathering of the church. Uh, which I, I would consider a sacrament. I consider the gathering of the saints sacramental, that God is with us when we gather in a way that he's not with us when I'm hanging out with a bunch of Christians in Starbucks. Um, and so uh, the, the, there does seem to be some indicator that at least on the first go of it for some of these guys in Acts and, and um, that there was some sort of like overtaking almost, but uh, that wasn't my experience. My experience was somebody prayed for me, and they were like, hey, you've got to speak. And I was like, but what do I say? And they're like, I don't know. It doesn't come from your mind, though. It comes from down here in, like, your gut. And so I just started speaking, and um, initially I thought it was just me making it up. Uh, I really did. Um, And then I would forget what I said, and, and I would try it again, and maybe a month later. And the same words would come out. And so one of the other things I was encouraged to do was, hey, look, you're, you may feel like it's gibberish. It doesn't always feel supernatural. Um, but, you know, if you're just trying to worship God and you're just trying to do what you think is a godly thing to do, which is to, to appreciate a gift that he may have given you, um, just do it and, and trust that God will take over in the process. And believe it or not, that's what I did. I just kept doing it. And um, the language eventually took on a life of its own. Uh, and today, I've had a number of uh, times where people have understood me speaking in fluent Portuguese. I've had people understand me speaking Italian. Mm. Um, it's, it's definitely a very, it's clearly a romance language of some sort. But 
I don't know what it is. Yeah, wow. Um, and it's not just one of those languages because I've had people understand me in different languages. Or I've had people who know Spanish fluently go, yeah. well, you said this word, which sounds a lot like <laughs> this word in Spanish. Yeah. And so then they've told me some things that, that they thought I've said. Maybe a historical And I've had a number branch. of other... Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, and so... That's been my experience, and I can't tell you how many times. At the, at the most recent Remnant Radio conference we did down in Oklahoma City, I did a workshop on tongues and interpretation. Now, I tell people I, I, can't, uh, I can't teach you to operate in a gift that you don't have, to be clear. God gives the gifts. I can teach you how the gift seems to work in Scripture uh, and my own experience of it. And that is often very helpful for people when it comes to understanding whether or not they have that gift or not. And one of the other ways you find out if, you're, if what you're doing is actually tongues is when somebody understands you. I always find it funny that people say, well, don't, don't speak in tongues uh, unless there's an interpreter in, in every setting. And I'm like, no, this is the gathering of the saints that Paul's concerned about. He's concerned about unbelievers or people uninformed about gifts being in the meeting and right. thinking you're crazy, so a home which is what happens be, in some of these... Yeah. Well, in an environment where it's a bunch of people who understand what the gift is, yeah. uh, I'm less concerned about that. Um, and I think Paul was less concerned about that. But also, how is anyone going to know that they have a gift of interpretation unless <laughs> someone speaks in a tongue? Yeah, that's a good point. So you've yeah. got to have some place for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's been my experience. I've seen a number of people get the gift of interpretation mm -hmm. uh, when I've felt inclined to speak in front of an audience. Um, and that happened at the most remnant, recent Remnant Radio conference that we did in October. Had, yeah. I don't know, five or six people understand a good portion of what I said. Wow. And some of them got very similar uh, interpretations, okay. which was very yeah. confirming for, for even those who have the gift mm -hmm. of interpretation, that they also would doubt if it's real. Right. They would hear you yeah. speaking in tongues, and they would hear something in English right next to it. Or mm -hmm. they would know a good bit of the language itself and said, you just said this word, and here's what it means. They just understood on some level, so uh, that was that was quite the the experience for them. Yeah. But I'd seen that happen a number of times. Hmm. Yeah, it's just not something that I've particularly experienced beyond the, uh, I guess, the prayer language uh, kind of aspect of it, where you know I hear people kind of just praying it to themselves or, or singing, you know, over a prayer or worship or something like that. So I've never witnessed personally. You, you have to come to. A conference. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I, I was actually looking to see, you know, have you got a new one planned for this year? But, you know, I'll be I'll be there. I'll, I'll try my best to make it. We for do. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we've got one taking place in, uh, in October uh, at Woods Edge Church down in uh, Houston. I don't know if that's public news. I might have just given given it out too early we got an exclusive. That's what we're planning on. <laughs> our first uh, yeah. world world exclusive on the show <laughs> the, i mean there's no there's no tickets yet available for it yeah. uh, but there will be and, and we do charge for it we don't charge mm -hmm. a lot we try to make it very affordable but yeah. it is uh it'll be me michael and josh uh likely mm -hmm. sam storms will be there um so yeah. it should be a lot of fun following on from that then i guess you know interpretation as you said you I guess you have to be around tongues in order to know if, if you can interpret. And in your experience, do people know, um, do they hear it as if they understand it and then kind of translate it? Or is it like God kind of gives them, they hear it and then maybe a translation afterwards? How does that tend to work? Um, well, just to be clear, I, I don't interpret tongues, mm -hmm. so I only know what, you you know, what they tell me. Um, my wife does. Um, not always, she doesn't always get interpretation. It's not always like, uh, on call, so to speak. Um, there are other people that do, um, there's a, a young woman in my church who her other husband is, is our executive pastor, elder in training. Um, but she, she understands a good bit. A matter of fact, we've done a few deliverances together where I'll pray in tongues and she'll interpret and, and in that very moment, we've literally, uh, identified what evil spirit we're dealing with and was able to call it out. And so it's been super helpful in that capacity. But um, what, from what I've understood, they even doubt it themselves. Like, is this real? Is, is this really? For her, she just knew what the words meant. Uh, but for my wife, she would hear English right next to it. And so what helped my wife to go, oh, wow, that really is interpretation is there was a time where I prayed in tongues and I would go, I'd pray in and out of tongues in, you know, mm -hmm. in tongues and then in English and then in tongues and then in English. 
and she was still questioning whether she was really interpreting. Mm. Um, but but the interesting that thing that happened is I would pray in tongues, and she would understand it, mm-hmm. and then I would pray in English the exact same thing I just prayed in tongues. Oh wow! Okay. So apparently I was interpreting my own tongues, yeah, which was a prayer, right? And, and so she was like, "You just said the same thing twice," <laughs> and I did that over and over again. And she didn't tell me till afterwards. So it's like your um, spirit and but, your mind were in sync on that prayer because I know it's really your spirit praying on you know right almost without your input. So it's interesting in that well, case that sorry, yeah, I, I want to be. No, I, I love that you mentioned that passage of scripture. It says when you know when I, when I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, mm-hmm. but my mind is fruitless. Right. But but just to be really clear, when people use the word uh, "do you pray in the spirit," I go, "What does that mean?" Uh, yeah, I think certainly praying in tongues is praying in the spirit, but I think praying in English is also praying in the spirit. Um, I don't I don't think that for your, for your prayer to be spiritual, it has to be tongues. Um, I don't even think that it, that the for your prayer to be answered and heard by God and powerful, I don't think it has to be in tongues. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, what makes your prayers powerful and effective, from what we know in Scripture, is not the language you pray in, but rather the humility in your heart. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. He hears the prayers of the proud from afar, but he's near to those who are contrite in spirit. Mm-hmm. So. so if if you were to, I guess, uh, think about how the, um, I guess, especially the gift of tongues operates. Is the spirit separate from the mind in the sense that it's, because I always, I guess the way it was explained to me is that the Holy Spirit, or our spirit, I guess, within us is kind of almost a separate entity that's kind of advocating for God's will on our behalf within us. And it's when you pray, I guess, in tongues or operate in those kind of spiritual gifts, it's almost a separate entity within us that's kind of doing or driving that. So to where whenever you pray in tongues, your mind is not exactly engaged with that. It's a, it's kind of going on vicariously through your body. Is that a correct way of understanding it, or is that incorrect in your opinion? I don't know. I I get nervous about any time where we try to separate parts of ourselves because mm-hmm. we know that we are not fully man without spirit and body, mm. um, and so I I just get a little hesitant to do that. There is a proverb that. And I can't remember what it is off offhand, where it says that the the spirit of a man is the candlestick of the Lord, searching out his innermost being. Uh, and the word innermost being is the same word used for the body part, part of your body that is considered your bosom. Um, and so the implication, I mean, a candlestick is something that's that's bringing to light. And so if the spirit of a man is is bringing to light your innermost being then that, that would make sense that your prayers, which are spiritual prayers, right? Your spirit prays, but your mind is fruitless, would be doing that. Um, I don't know for certain, right? That's kind of all inferential. Uh, one thing is clear, though, is that you can pray using your mind, and you can pray using your spirit. And Paul says to do both. In fact, he, he does both. And uh, the fact that it's prayer in and of itself makes it spiritual. Like, there is no... I get nervous when we try to separate and say, this is a spiritual activity and this is a natural activity. And I'm like, no, they're both spiritual. I think that's a whole other powerful. episode. They're effective. Really. The, I guess the, yeah. the, the trinity of your your mind and your soul or in your spirit, all these things, you know, it's there's a lot of definitions that are, everyone has a different definition of what those things are, I think. And well, it's, a, it's a hotly debated topic, actually. Yeah. You've got the Pentecostals who are what they call tripartite uh, ontology. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I, I'm not on that side, uh, although I have really glo- close friends that mm-hmm. are on that side. And so, you know, you, you're going to interpret these kind of passages mm-hmm. differently based on that. Yeah. That's something I'll probably delve into in a future episode because I don't think I'm particularly sure. I haven't looked into it too much, but me and Heather have argued about it a little bit, or not argued, but discussed about it, you know, which, what is the spirit? What is the mind? What is the soul? Or do animals have souls and not spirits? Do they have spirits, but not souls? <laughs> You know, there's a lot of, yeah. it's like you said, hotly debated, but um, I'm sure I probably committed multiple heresies in that last section whenever I was trying to articulate what I thought. So, Oh, so. I don't think those would fall into the category of heresy. <laughs> You're not leading people out of the faith. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would say these are actually tertiary things that we as yeah. brothers and sisters of Christ, we can, we can agree on quite amicably. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't that's... even think these affect your faith a whole lot, having a particular position on mm-hmm. this. Well, it's interesting you say that because I think um, 
especially with a cessationist movie that came out, it's it has become in some people's minds, for especially on the cessationist side, it's almost like a primary, real primary issue of faith. Whereas I think on the continuationist side, yeah. we're like, oh, you can believe or you can't. That's up to you. You're just missing out. Well, so. I would say on a small minority of cessationist, it is. Mm. The vast majority of – like the Jeff Durbin crowd, the Tom Schreiner, or, like, these guys don't agree with that. They're not thinking that – like Schreiner and, and Sam Storms are like really, really close friends. Uh, James White and Michael Brown are close friends. The, the fact is the, the group that made the cessationist film it represents a small minority of Christendom and a minority of cessationist as well. Um, and, and I think the reason is you always have the most vitriolic get the loudest voice. And that's what we have here with the cessationist guys is that they're actually rather vitriolic, insulting uh, when they in that video. Mm -hmm. And they just typecast all over the place. Yeah. And it's it's strange to me that I guess the people who I would often have looked at as the people who are the experts in the word, you know, like, I guess people like John MacArthur, you know, literally basically wrote the Bible and, and when his, you know, in his translations and commentaries. So it's, uh, he, you know, has been a, a man that's known as a scholar of the Bible, same with like St uh, Stephen Lawson and other such people. It's, they're real people. Yeah, like, but they don't, go they ahead. don't interact with the best of charismatic scholarship. They ignore it entirely. Yeah. I mean, like, exactly. why, why did, uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm, this is, I just happen to have a lot of insight into this one. Why did John MacArthur never debate Jack Deere? They were actually supposed to show up at a radio station to debate one another, and John MacArthur just no-called, no-showed. Uh, why is it that they don't quote him? Uh, in, in his newest book that he did, uh, what was it called, Strange Fire? Why doesn't he quote Jack Deere's arguments? Why is he still going back to Gaffin? Um, it's the fact is they don't want to interact with the best. They just want to win a debate, but they're, yeah. they're not actually debating real scholars. What I tend to see online is this kind of argument of have you, are, are you, when you prophesy, are you saying that that is on the same level as scripture because God never lies? That's kind of their whole, the, the kind of straw man yeah. that I see being built up is that it's, there is no such thing, I guess, as a, a fallible human aspect to any of the gifts because if it's God speaking, it's God speaking. It's either he speaks or he doesn't. But whereas, you know, I right. look back and I see Nathan, you know, incorrectly interpreting what he believed God was saying in a certain circumstance. And it's like there, there is a, there humans can mess up anything that God wants them to do at any time. Well, so what I love is the, the fact that with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have tons of literature now that shows uh, that historically speaking, Judaism, not rabbinic Judaism, which is pharisaical Judaism, but the rest of Judaism, believed that there was always two kinds of prophecy. There was the written words that were infallible, and then there were prophecies that were not considered part of the Canaan, that were always accepted as truly prophetic, but not uh, to be taken authoritatively in all places and all times. And so there was a, a dissemination of two different kinds of prophecy, one which would be, uh, and this actually makes sense when you think about covenantal language, it makes sense that we would have an old covenant, uh, and then when the Lord died, that covenant ended, just like in a marriage, a covenant ends when one partner dies, which allowed when he resurrected, it allowed there to be a new covenant that was mm -hmm. made. Yeah, good point. So there was always this expectation that there would be covenant, and, but there was always prophecies outside of the covenant. Right. And I think that's the thing they get lost on is they want to hold to, well, it's only the covenant mm -hmm. that exists as God's voice speaking to us. Right. And I'd say, no, no, there's always been prophetic words outside of the covenant. And, and it fundamentally misunderstands the, I guess, the concept and the, the purpose of a prophecy, because I think not all prophecy is meant to be for the purpose of, I guess, speaking... Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Well, it, yeah. Like there's another. There's other purposes. Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, I always saw it as there's. Um, I don't think prophecy is necessarily always to to be used in the sense that the or the way that the YouTube prophets kind of operate, where it's a big revelation from God about future events that are going to happen, and this is like it's fortune telling effectively. And I don't see the gift of prophecy in that way. I don't think it's necessarily always for fortune telling. I understand yeah. it as the the primary purpose at least from what i've read in scripture is that it's for building up edifying and it's really for 
individuals or a group like a personal relationship is part of that so when you're speaking into the into the ether like some word for somebody out there for you know over a city or over whatever that's to me there's a misunderstanding as to what the the primary purpose i think is to there's to be a relational aspect to that well i think there is there is a place for there to be prophetic words that have to do with the future and have to do with nations have to do with kings Mm -hmm. and heads of state and I think there is, you know, Agabus predicted a famine and it allowed people to make a decision on what to do with it, right? Mm-hmm. It allowed the church in particular. But he was also a well-known prophet with a well-known track record of mm-hmm. accuracy, and he was in the local body of believers. Right. Um, accountability there. Yeah, there's some some real accountability. Um, and I think there's people like that today. I really do. Uh I think what we've seen though is a failure to account for bad words given. Um, I mean, the Trump prophecies was a telltale sign. But it, you, so let's let's take Jeremiah as an example. You see in Jeremiah uh, him rebuking Hananiah, saying, "Hey, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. You've caused these people to trust in a lie." Now, what's also interesting is Hananiah's prophecy was given after Jeremiah's. So Jeremiah comes with this yoke on his neck, and he says, "Hey, kings." You're going to be taken in the way of Babylon. You're going to be into forced servitude. It's best that you not fight this battle. It's best that you submit yourself to Babylon. This is God's judgment. Uh, it'll be easier for you to be in servitude under the king of Babylon if you listen to the words I'm saying to you, right? Well, then Hananiah comes and, and then breaks the yoke and says, in two years, the yoke of Babylon will be broken. Okay, so you got competing words. And then Jeremiah, he's all sarcastic in it. And he's like, would that it be the way Hananiah prophesied? But then he goes on to say, but God has not sent you. You're causing these people to trust in a lie. You're actually going to create suffering in Israel, of all Israelites, because of this word. And so then you have this test. Okay, well, who's the true prophet? Who's right? Well, two years later, Hananiah dies. Sorry, two months later, Hananiah dies, which tells you a lot. Right. He predicted two years, but then he died in two months. Mm which means God's word through Jeremiah stood the test. Right. And it's So there was a foretelling and it was helpful and it was a good it was a kindness that God did that for a, a nation that didn't deserve it. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I, I, do you think that's the kind of um the way that that operates today though in 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 most cases because um I just I think the way I tend to see it being operated in most cases is is like I said it with from person to person or speaking into giving you a glimpse of something in, in life. You know, I don't, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is not that that can't take place, the fortune telling side of things, for want of a better term, but that its primary purpose, yeah. I guess, is for that personal edification and kind of so, within the context of relationship. I think, uh, I think I just want to be careful to say, to leave room for there to be real words like Jeremiah gave to Israel and the king of Israel. Um, but at the same time say, I think what we're seeing on YouTube isn't that. I think it is a lot of false prophecy um, because I think it's causing people who should be repenting to not repent, which is exactly what is, was happening in Jeremiah's day. We're living in an incredibly sinful time in history. Uh, we, we as a people, both in the church and outside the church, there's a lot of repentance that's needed. Um, the amount of abuse stories, I mean, just one right after the next of, of senior pastors or, or abusive elder structures or, you know, going go down the list. And so the prophesying that's coming about is, is ending with the result that those who do evil are not repenting from the evil that they're doing. Um, and then, but what should be largely experienced is what you're describing, a relational context, a church context and church setting where words are given to individuals that edify the whole body. So let me give you a, a, as an example of what this could look like. Um, you know, uh, Recently, I was at a church in Wisconsin. I look at a woman, and the Lord shows me that she has stenosis of the spine, and she also had a sister who just died from a short-term memory issue, and she's afraid she's going to get that same short-term memory issue. That's a lot of details, very specific details. Those details had to do with one person. So the question is, is how might that be beneficial for the body at large to demonstrate that gift on a public platform inside of a church? Well, the beauty of it is, is I when I say these words to this woman, if it's right, it causes the whole room to go, oh my gosh, God, God just singled this woman out. 
What that does is it builds the faith of everybody there because it lets them know that God still cares, that he's still willing to speak details to an individual, but it gets the whole church's attention. Yeah, it glorifies him. And that's him. exactly what happened. Right. So I say these things to her. She runs to the front just crying, says, my sister died of, a, of uh, dementia. I'm afraid that I'm going to get it. Um, and yes, I've had four surgeries on my spine for stenosis. And so got to pray with her, uh, got to just give her a hug and comfort her for the, the pain she's had with her sister and just the fear she's trembled under. And, uh, and the Lord got to release a lot of that in that moment. So I don't know if she got healing for the stenosis. Um, I imagine this will be something I, I may find out in the future. But the fact is all those words were accurate, which leads me to believe that God probably did some healing, whether that means removing the fear or uh, the pain in the, in the back. But I don't know for certain. I know the word was accurate. And I know that the whole church took a double take on that one. And, and it ca probably caused a little fear. They're like, uh-oh, what does this guy know about me? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I know nothing. Yeah, I know nothing unless the Lord shows me. Yeah, but that little bit <laughs> but of fear is always, you know, it's always a good thing just to have that little bit of... It, <laughs> well, it does. Yeah. The fear of the Lord causes mankind to turn from sin, and that's right. a good thing. Yeah, it, so. for sure, because you know he's... I mean... <laughs> To, to be humorous about it, he, you know he's still watching, right? He's Everything's going to come to light eventually. And like you said, with, with people who are prominent in ministry that fall, you know, everything that goes on will come to light eventually. And it, it's it's really, I think well, God enables people to do that at the right times. Yeah, and, and when I say that he, he knows and there should be a fear of the Lord, it's not a fear of the Lord like he's a cosmic cop. No. It's like he knows, but he's also the one who sent his son to die for that sin. And so his mercy and his grace and his kindness is, it, it, you know, behold the severity and kindness of the Lord, right? Mm. You know, for those who are willing to repent, the kindness of the Lord. Mm. For those who are unwilling to repent, severity and judgment. Mm -hmm. And both of those things are good. Yeah. And just to, to kind of wrap up on the prophetic word side of things, again, coming from a beginner's perspective, um, this one I have a little more personal experience with, but if someone was a, a beginner, um, is there a a test that you would apply that could help someone discern whether like if, if they're praying and they get something flashes in their in their head which t tends to be the way i experience things or like a, a, a almost like a cinematic scene i tend to experience every now and then so what would how would you test that prophecy yourself would, would it does someone else need to be involved in that or is there a way that we can discern it uh so when I'm hearing something that's like that, I kind of have a process that I go through. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, if it's a visionary type experience, something that passes through my mind, I'm, I'm the next step in, in me is I assume that it's probably God, but I don't know for sure. And then I start to ask God, what does this mean? Help me understand mm -hmm. this. Is this something that I'm supposed to share? Is this something I'm supposed to keep to myself and pray about? Uh, so I'm asking all of these kinds of questions and waiting to get more information from God and instruction from Him before mm -hmm. I share. But then at the end of the day, I usually don't know for certain that everything I'm hearing is really from the Lord mm -hmm. until I share what I felt like He's shared with me. Mm -hmm. And then let that word get judged. And one of the ways that that is judged is by the person on the receiving end. Mm -hmm. Hey, is this true? Does this have any bearing in your life? Now, people will say, I get a witness on it, and I go, well, that's not as exactly as helpful. I want to know if it actually, like, you look at it and go, no, this applies to this exact part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, although, I, although I think there is some credulity to somebody saying, uh, yeah, that, that the witnesses. So. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that's kind of the process. Do you, it's, not, it's not an easy, yeah. it's like Moses going, well, God, how do I know this is going to happen? Yeah. And the Lord's like, well, you'll know when you and all of Israel are here on this mountain worshiping me. It's like, yeah. that's not very reassuring, is it? <laughs> and this is the part of, um, I guess, this learning this um, remotely, I guess. And, and I want to experience this more personally. And I'm sure a lot of people out there want to experience these things more personally, but haven't had opportunities yet. So it's kind of a almost like a remote learning where you're trying to read up and you're trying to, to view things and, and watch content about this. But what what is always a struggle is, I guess, the specifics and that's the part where i think it is there are there are different things for different people in different ways that they experience the gifts but i always wondered you know hearing from god okay we have samuel in the temple that's one way you know audible voice that kind of thing or still small voice here and there we have you know people a lot of people talk about images a lot of people talk about various different things 
Um, in your experience or from what from what you've heard from others and the way you've experienced it yourself, do you tend to know that this is something that's not from me, that this is probably something from God? Or is it a matter of when you've, if someone was doing this for the first time and they kind of feel like there's an urge, should they always kind of explore that? Or is there a way, should they try to weed it out a little bit? Like how would, you, is there a way to know? <laughs> that's a hard question. So but... Again, I, I, I just don't think, um, I don't think that's going to be the same answer for every person and even for the same person in the various ways that God speaks to the same person. Um, I'll tell you for me, by and large, I don't know that it's God until after I share the word. I would say that, and this is where I think the, the process is difficult because it's, for me, it's not some big booming voice in heaven. Clouds don't part and a dove descend. It's, it's almost every single time it's, I'm praying and then I have a thought or an image come to my mind. And the thought and image that comes to my mind comes in such a way that I think it's just me, but I don't know. And so I think that's how God intervenes in the process is it doesn't always feel supernatural. And I think of uh, Job 33, 14, the, the only guy in Job that seems to not get rebuked, he seems to be the voice of wisdom, and he also is the youngest one in the whole book. But he's also, he, he waits to talk until the very end, which is another thing about wisdom, right? You're slow to speak, uh, quick to listen. Like this guy, it, it, at the end, the two other friends of Job, they get cursed. Like they have to come to Job and beg for forgiveness and have Job pray for them before they get free from their curse. But not this guy. This guy is the one reasonable person throughout the entirety of Job. Even Job himself is, it gets rebuked. And so this young guy, he says, in the argument of whether or not God speaks, he says, no, God does speak here one way, there another, though man may not perceive it. I just don't know any other way that this works. Like, um, there are times where you'll know it's God, but by and large, it seems like he speaks in such a way that you could dismiss it like a dream yeah. and a vision. And perhaps uh, that's in a way that it, you kind of are forced to rely on him or, or draw near to him to even get these little glimpses here and there. Um, and I think that's really helpful and I appreciate you sharing your perspective on that because I think that is reassuring and helpful for the more beginner side of things out there or people like me who well, are... I'm um, still a beginner. Right. Well, it's, I mean, I, you know, I envy those who have had opportunities throughout their whole lives and I still have time ahead of me to do that, I hope, and to, to explore that more. But I'm still, I guess, on the beginning sure. of a journey of, of doing that. And yeah. I think it is helpful to hear that there you know you don't have to be certain but you do have to subject yourself to testing like you can't just i don't think you should just go out there and just fire up a youtube channel and just say whatever comes to your mind but whenever you are praying right. for people you should you know you can ask them and just say i don't know if this is from me or from god but does this apply or saying to an, an elder or a pastor you know i i feel like i've heard this but can you help me discern through this so i think it's helpful to hear that because I think a lot of people are looking for certainty where there may not be certainty. It may be just a, there may be in a, a part of this. We all want trial certainty. And error. Yeah. And that's the hardest yeah. part. And if, well, just I mean, to, that's true in everything in life. Yeah. Right. And all these things that, that I don't think they give us certainty, but they do give us little glimpses of God speaking into our circumstances here and there. Well, the, the trials that we go through in life, they wouldn't be called trials if we knew the outcome. It's that we're, we're actually told to trust God and we'll see in the outcome that God was faithful to us, you know, but, but that's the nature of, of, of trial. Right. Exactly. Just to finish off on one more quick thing, if we're okay on time, um, I, I, if, if it's okay, I'd love to talk a little bit about that healing deliverance side of things just for a few minutes, because that's it's a another long conversation. One. I know I'm, I'll try to keep it, you know, a little, a little briefer, you know, this is kind of our our overview of all of these kind of, I guess, the, the ones that are most prominent, the gifts that are usually mm -hmm. operated in most obviously. But um, again, with healing and, and I guess it's deliverance is related to that, but a little bit well, different. When it, comes to, when it comes to devils, it's not a gift. Okay. Yeah. When it comes to casting out demons, I don't think it's a gift. So um, that's something that everyone, everyone should be doing. I think so. Do. Uh yeah, well, uh, the the nature when it, of us when it comes to demons has nothing to do with a gift, although gifts are certainly helpful in the process. 
but it has to do with our, our heavenly state. It says we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, and then it names off what it's above, right? So it tells us what he means by that, like being in Christ, in his seat of judgment, in, in his place of authority, above every rule, every power, every principality, you know, the stoicheia, right, in Greek. The idea is that we have authority over the dark forces of this world that are afflicting mankind. And so our our uh, ability to cast out demons is simply because we're in Christ. Mm, okay, yeah, that's a good way of putting it, because I, I guess maybe just in my mind, I kind of grouped them as, as if it were a healing process when... I suppose thinking biblically, it is something that we're just kind of commanded to do along with the Great Commission. It's like, go out and just, you know, cast out demons or devils, as you say, you know, uh, yeah, I, just, I mean, as you all like to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, um, well, I mentioned this because I know that there are people that are really good at doing that. And, and oftentimes having certain gifts, is super yeah. helpful. They may mm -hmm. have a gift of discernment of spirits, which our cessationists would di define it differently than me. They'd be like, yeah. if it's from God or not God. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, it's about seeing spirits. Right. Um, and I know people like this. I have a girl in my church who will literally see these things on people. And so mm. she knows what she's dealing with and how to call it out. Yeah. Um, so all that to say, I, I think uh, uh, the, there are gifts that are super helpful and make your deliverance ministry a little mm -hmm. bit easier, a little bit more effective. But I do think it's the work of all Christians to do that. Yeah. I know that some church traditions have it that there are specific procedures to go through in that deliverance process. Um, is it generally better if someone suspects that someone is under a kind of uh, an oppression of some sort that they should tackle that and kind of dive in and and because I'm wary of the the there is it's not quite the same thing but there are times in the Bible where people have been kind of come out on the wrong end before going into it flippantly or saying you know just throwing in the name of Jesus to try and you know heals you know like the the story of the the, the demon saying I know Jesus I don't know who you are so well is, but again. The, the people that were trying to do that were not in Christ. Mm -hmm. They weren't people that were seated in heavenly places, mm -hmm. right? That, 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 that seat in Christ is, is where we get to do this stuff. And you're talking about mm -hmm. the sons of Sceva who were not believers in yeah. Christ. I think there's people so out they, there that they are tried cautious to, because of things yeah. like that. Yeah, I get it. Uh, I totally get it. But uh, let me, let me re repackage what deliverance looks like. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you have a a uh, an animal fall into a ditch, are you going to help it get out? Yeah, yeah. If you have a friend who's uh, you know a little bit behind in rent and need a hundred bucks, they're normally a very faithful person. They've just fallen on hard times. Mm -hmm. Are you going to help them with finances? Yeah. You, when I think of deliverance, I see somebody who's either they themselves fell into sin. Or, and this thing got in, or they were the victim of somebody else's sin, which is another way people get demonized, or they were uh, an offspring of somebody who was in sin. Because um, I don't, I, I do believe in this idea that that people can be demonized because of the sins of their ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, and in, and I'm not saying that that's, you know, it, it's hard for people to look at that and go, that well, that's fair. And mm -hmm. I go, well, let's remember when the Lord talks about visiting the sins, punishing the sins of the father on the third and fourth generation. He's not just saying that as an old covenant principle. Mm -hmm. Like this isn't just this isn't just old covenant. This yeah. is him talking about his name. Yeah. The Lord like, the Lord. It's a generational like curse as some people call it. Well he he attaches it to his name in the same way he attaches a blessing to his name and patience to his name and faithfulness to his name. In the very same passage where he's talking about his great attributes, he also talks about his sense of justice. And whether as an individualistic Western mindset is right or wrong on this, uh, it is very clear that, that, there, that God is saying there's something good, right, and just for the Lord afflicting somebody to the third and fourth generation. Mm -hmm. And I just have to say, okay, well, yeah. you, you understand justice. I don't. we got to trust them. Um, so I mention all of these things to say when it comes to setting people free from demons, mm -hmm. it's not about you know, me. It's about that person who's afflicted and hurting that God loves and has given Christians the authority to help and, and to, to turn a blind eye to that help. It would be hard to, to reconcile. So I see it as a way of helping people. My problem today, honestly, is that I have so many people who want prayer that I can't do it all. And, and it's frustrating to me because so few Christians are doing this 
And it's and those who are doing it are being demonized left and right. Like yeah. you're such a bad person. You're mm-hmm. saying people are demonized. I'm like, I'm not saying that scriptures yeah. are showing it. That's true. Yeah. There's evidence um, of it. And so yeah, and, and we're seeing more like we're, like I said, where there where sin abounds, there is more and more evil yeah. spirits that are afflicting people. Mm. And so so I just see it as a as a way of loving uh, yeah. those who God loves. But it's something the average Christian can kind of give it a rattle for one of a better term again. And yeah, so that's, I think there's a lot of nerves there because, you know, people are kind of afraid and maybe rightfully so in some cases, but also I think it's something we can all take part in. I I don't think we should be afraid uh, because again, we win. We're seated in Christ. If you're afraid, it means you don't quite recognize the authority that Christ has given you by being in Christ. There is a, a, world of authority and power that we get to operate in because we represent him. We are his ambassadors. Um, and as such, we have power. Yeah. And, and just as a final point, um, as uh, in terms of healing, again, there's a sovereignty of God thing with that where I, I, I believe that God will or can heal regardless of whether a person has a I guess a gift of healing because it's his, if it's his sovereign will to heal someone after prayer that you know that he can do that but um I guess the gift of healing is not something that everyone has unlike the deliverance side of things would that be fair to say You know what's interesting is that's the only gift in 1 Corinthians 12 that's pluralized he doesn't just call it a gift of healing he calls it gifts plural oh, okay. of mm. healings plural mm. And so in my mind it, my guess it's just me guessing is that it's yeah. highly likely everybody is called to do some healing prayer. Um, you may see broken backs get healed. Other people may see cancer. Uh, I tend to see a lot of feet get healed. I see a lot of deaf ears get healed. Um, but I don't see a lot of multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's, which I've prayed for several times. I've just never seen it healed. Uh, autism. I've not seen it healed. Um, and so it, I think there's a there's room, a lot more room in that for everybody. But but at the end of the day, yes, God is the one who sovereignly gives that gift. Uh, and yet, the other thing about it is, God's good, and He listens to the prayers of His kids who love Him and love others. And when we pray for somebody who's sick, it is a way to love people with the power of God. So, well, that's a I think that's a perfect note to end on. So I just want to thank you for taking the time, like I said, to to come talk about this stuff and. You know, there's there's plenty more, you know, that we could have talked about and perhaps in the future, you know, we can we can talk about some other stuff and get into the weeds a little bit. But, uh, you know, sure. I just appreciate you helping just uh, the brief overview of kind of a lot of these things where, again, from people that just don't have experience, myself kind of included in that, you know, these are helpful conversations to have when you're trying to dive in and, and get get stuck in for the first time. So I really appreciate your your perspective on those. Yeah, of course, man. Happy to. Hopefully yeah. it's helpful for your audience, helpful for you, and, and maybe I could see you at a conference at some point in time. Yeah, where, absolutely. Where, remind me again, where, where are you located? Is it I'm in North Florida. Said? Yeah, North Florida. So originally from UK, moved to North Florida. So um, where, it, where in North Florida? In Lake City. There's a whole panhandle thing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so Lake North City, Central. Okay. Yeah, so I guess I, yeah. in my accent, I'd say Lake City, but here it's Lake City. So yeah. Um, Lake City, yeah. Kind of right in the spines as you turn on to... I seventy five and head down the spine of Florida. So well, I'll be I'll be somewhat close to you. I think a couple times. Let me see. Where am I going to be? I know I have. Uh, I'll be in Memphis. That's not very close to you. <laughs> well, uh, it's, yeah, not as not as far away as like Washington or Colorado or something. But yeah, yeah, it's still within yeah. road trip territory. So that's pretty cool. I know I'll be in Georgia. Uh, okay, that's probably now we're talking to, closer. Yeah. But that will be in the summer of 2025. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'll put that one on I started there. getting booked out for July 4th wow. summer camps, and I already had a booking this year. And so the guy was like, yeah. can you do it next year? So, yeah. So. I mean, got to gotta get you in the in the schedule while you can. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll certainly, you know, I'll, I'm, if this podcast goes out um, after the announcement is made officially, obviously we get the scoop here, but um, if the official uh announcement has been made about the next conference i'll be sure to put all the links in the in the bio below in the description and uh sounds good um yeah and thanks to all of our uh, viewers for tuning in again um but that's all for this week on the two things you shouldn't talk about thanks so much if you enjoyed make sure you subscribe and like and uh, like i said comment your thoughts below but um, i'll see you again on the next episode